Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mental Matters with Willie Drinkwater. How about that, Willie? You get the uh, headline. Uh, I am Hi-ho. Andy Bernstein. Hi ho! I am your host and moderator, Andy Bernstein. So, for almost the past two years, we called our show "The Map," the Mental Health and Addiction Podcast. And then uh, we went on hiatus over the past several weeks, and we made a decision to change the format of the show a bit. And now we have a new name <clears throat> and made some changes to the show, including some interesting stories, a new host to the show, and more about the overall topic of mental health and how it is affecting us all. Before we were on the, with the show, um, let's meet Willie Drinkwater. Willie Tell the audience who you are and your background. I like walks in the country and oh yeah, okay. So so anyway, yeah. Time um, at the I, beach, pina colada. Oh, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've been in the uh, in the mental health addiction field for you know 32, 32 33 years now. Uh, I work as a therapist. I'm an educator for UMass Boston. Uh, I've worked all, all the modalities in treatment over the year, from freestanding detoxes to hospital detoxes to IOPs to PHPs. Uh, to shelter action, um, been a preceptor for Harvard Medical School for first year residents while on their rotation on uh, addiction with co-occurring disorders. Uh, also on the board, the board of directors of MADAC, which is the Mass Association of Alcohol Drug Abuse Counselors. Uh, I'm a big fan of Rick and Morty. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so my, my so, previous life, I know you're going to ask me. My, no, my no, previous, no. I was going to go. I was going to yeah. flip it on you. Go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, in my uh, previous life in the 80s, I was a member of the Not Before Breakfast Big Mattress Players at WBC out in Boston under DJ Charles Laquadera and probably the most talented voice guy in the industry, Mr. Billy West. And uh, if the name sounds familiar, you probably know him as Red and Stimpy and Doug on Nickelodeon and the Cheerios Honey Nut Bee and the Red M&M. And I'm a big, big believer in the use of humor in everyday life. I use it in my therapy sessions. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't have enough humor. That's for sure. Now, you he- release endorphins. You, know, you have a private time. practice and in your, and you uh, you see, um, you know, you talk about co-occurring disorders. Explain yes. what that is. Yeah, co-occurring disorders. I mean, you show me anyone that's been in the detox six or seven times and I'll, I'll show you someone, someone that has another mental health issue going on that's not getting addressed, which is referred to as a co-occurring disorder. It can be one more, you know, it can be one, two, three, but, you know, it's addiction with other mental health issues. So... Co-occurring. So, um, so that's going to be a big topic because that's really one of the things that is affecting um, addiction and other mental health issues um, is our co-incurring disorders. So, um, we'll talk about that in um, as we go forward. We should, in the show. should talk about how we came up with with mental matters. Too, yeah, why know, don't like you to, tell people about that? Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, go I mean, ahead. The title of the show is Mental Matters, but that's because you know, I mean, you can take that two ways. You know, mental matters, or mental matters that affect affect mental health so you know that's why i didn't want to just have the scope of you know mental health addiction and let's look at criteria and what's going on there but you know what's the causation behind it a lot of times you know so you know nature nurture is an environment i mean uh you know not that the politics has affected anyone in this country you know so i mean i mean the anxiety levels the depression levels since the start of the pandemic i mean you know they've, they've just gone through the ceiling well i think that's a good explanation sir um and then let's meet our 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 rookie our 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 newest member of the team now um kristen perry long is still part of our team she is not with us today Mm -hmm. but she will be back next time that we uh we uh all can rejoin together i was gonna say couldn't join but the next time we rejoin um that's a medical issue (laughs) <laughs> that's right um we're gonna welcome uh, uh someone who um is a, a big favorite of mine and her name is beth stark and she is also known she's the goose mom the self-proclaimed goose mom beth goose mom. who are you and tell us about yourself and what you uh what you're all about um, so my name is Beth Stark. Uh, I'm the mom to a beautiful six-year-old little boy, most importantly, and I work as a certified peer specialist and recovery coach for a nonprofit here in Massachusetts. And I'm also pursuing my master's in social work at Simmons University right now. Yeah. And and you pers- and personally, you've struggled with 
So um, I live with a mental health diagnosis of bipolar and I've also been battled addiction. I'm four and a half years sober. And, um, for the co-occurring disorders, bipolar, when that came about was probably the golden goose. That was what made the most sense and helped me get my life back, figuring that out. In two minutes or less, what is the goose mom? Give me, give me, why, why do you call yourself? Can you do uh, it in two uh, minutes and less? Sure. So, okay. um, I had a cathartic experience with a goose that helped me tap into the pain of being a parent with uh, a mental health and substance abuse problem. And I was able to identify the feelings that coming from kind of like being um, left for a temporary time to figure out my stuff. And um, geese always travel in packs. And so one time I had experience with a goose that was alone and she made me see that's how I felt. And I was able to kind of start my process to healing to where I am today. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So let's, uh, let's change gears. Let's get started. Um, yeah, I, just, with the, I just want, want, want to cut, cut in a bit. I'm, I'm also a person with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and a substance abuse issue. And, you know, it was, I was sober for 10 years before, before I dealt with the bipolar piece. And it's like, when I look back now, it's like, I don't know how I made it the first 10 years sober without addressing it. Cause I was still going a hundred miles an hour. You know, so. Yeah, that's a whole. Uh, what well, definitely we we'll definitely want to talk about bipolar because I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about what it is yes. yeah. and it, uh, you know the levels. The di- it's also become the diagnosis of the day now. Like you know, in the '90s, everyone was ADD, ADD, ADHD, and now we're you know everyone coming out of the detox. Oh, uh, yeah, it's uh, bipolar disorder, and it's like now nah, it's a very select group that Beth and I belong to. Yes. You know, yes. not everyone can join it. You know, it's the select group, you know, they're trying to inflate our numbers, but we're not going to let that happen, Beth, right? No, no, we're not. No, we're not. It's a that's club. A, that's a club. That's a club. That's right. That's right. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll I mean, talk about that. Wednesday on Jupiter. You know, it's good. And, uh, you know. <laughs> at, at the mall. <laughs> at the mall. <laughs> you can go shopping. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so let's change gears. Uh, um, okay. As you know, um, or as I mentioned, or you didn't know, is November is military family appreciation month and to get a jump on it or uh, early um we wanted to tell we're going to start telling stories willie has compiled a ton of stories in his 75 years working in the industry (laughs) i'm kidding i'm kidding no 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 actually actually you can put it out there now my my linkedin page uh on my linkedin page if you if you go to articles I i have about 46 articles that i've written over the years from uh it's almost like uh, Hunter S. Thompson style. It's the Gonzo style of George journalism, where I'm writing from inside the story, and the stories from uh, inpatient psych addiction I worked, and from the detoxes. And some of them are humorous, and some of them are crushing. So you know, it can go either way. We're, so we're going to talk about we're going to um, you know tell more of your stories because, as you know, I was saying, you've accumulated so many, and it's you know people like stories, and they can kind of. Uh, you know, there's a lot to learn from stories. So I'm going to turn it over to you for story time with Willie. And you have a great story about a V, you know, uh, called the, the Vietnam vet. Mm-hmm. Correct. Correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. So tell us, tell us about the story. Yeah. I, I want you all to gather in a circle, sit down on the floor and be quiet. <laughs> we'll okay. go from there. Beth, Beth probably is used to hearing that type of stuff with her six year old. Right. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, no, I was working at the uh, Caspar at the time. Caspar, Caspar is no more. It, uh, it was on Beacon Street. It rode the line between Cambridge and Somerville. We were a 28 bed facility. Uh, we were what's referred to as a freestanding detox because we weren't in a hospital in, in environment. Cambridge Hospital was just a mile down the street, but we had a Vietnam vet. And, you know, we, we used to have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like month, monthly people that would come in from Albany Street Shelter, and he was one of them and stuff. And, uh, you know, never wanted to go for VA services or anything. Didn't want to talk about Vietnam. We, we, we actually had a counselor at the time, John, John Dolan, who's, who's still, as far as I know, the head of addiction over at South Bay and stuff. John was a Vietnam vet. And uh, this guy, Rich, not his real name, Rich would, you know, he would pretty much, he'd only talk to John. And in those days, addiction counselors, when, you, when we worked, if you, uh, we did everything. We not only did, you know, quote, addiction counseling, but, uh, you know, we, we, we swept the floors in the place. We did the patient's laundry. We did all the bedding laundry, the weekends, we were the ones serving the meals. So I was doing an overnight shift and I was down in the basement and stuff. And when I came back up, this guy, Rich was, uh, he had woken up during the night. And in those days you could smoke and stuff. And, uh, 
he was like sitting on a desk and we always had, you know, like a pot of uh, decaffeinated coffee going. And he was, he was just sitting there and he was smoking and it was, it was almost, it was like three o'clock in the morning, you know, and it, it was almost surreal because his, his smoke was going up towards the fluorescent lights and turning blue as it got up towards the lights. And, uh, you know, I was a smoker in those days. So, so, so I pulled out a butt and I sat on the desk a little farther down from him and stuff. And, uh, I was just sitting there and, uh, you know, all, all of a sudden, under his breath, he said, uh, um, a lot of good men died for nothing. And I'm thinking, OK, I've, I've got a feeling, he, you know, he had the dead man stare just straight ahead as he was saying it. So I was having the feeling that he was back over there again. He was back in Nam, you know, thinking about it and stuff. And uh, um, and, you know, I I, I said to him, I, I waited a little while and I said, uh, are you back over there? And he went, yeah. And I just kept, you know, smoking and having a cup of coffee, too. And then then all of a sudden he started to talk. He said, yeah, we were we were in the uh, we were in a fire, a firefight with the Viet Cong and they sent in a, 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 a chopper to get us out. And uh, I was I was struggling. I was the last one to get on the chopper. I was barely hanging on. And as the chopper went up, uh, a mortar round hit the chopper and it crashed and everyone was killed except me. And. He just, I mean, just thinking about it now, it just shreds me because, you know, he had this, uh, he had this like retching sobbing that you could tell was coming right, right from his soul, man. You know, just that aching, rocking feeling. And, uh, uh, you know, that was the first time he had, he had ever told anybody about it. So, I mean, I, I felt, I felt extremely privileged that he would allow me in, you know, and stuff. And, uh, but, you know, just that sobbing and retching that like it was just, it was just you know, overwhelming. And uh, from, you know, from from that point in time on, you know, uh, he started to talk to John Dolan more and he did end up go, going to, to Bedford VA for his services. So so I don't know what happened to him much after that. But, you know, I mean, every place I've worked over the years, when you work overnight shifts, they always tell you, you know, if the patients get up, they can stay up for 10 minutes, let them grab a bite to eat and shoo them off to bed. And, uh, you know, it's like, man, you're missing a great opportunity. Because when you, when you get people that wake up in the middle of the night and they want to stay up a while, their defenses haven't come up yet. They will tell you more at 3 a.m. You know, than they would tell you at 3 in the afternoon. So, you know, it's one of those things, if you ever get a chance, you know, if, if you're working overnights and somebody gets up, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily shoo them right back to bed. I think it's a great time to get a conversation going because their defense just isn't there yet. What are some of the things that, that you would talk about with him because you know the full story is is that well, um you yeah, had I mean, it's survivor's guilt you know i mean he had a heavy dose of survivor's guilt man you know which is what does that what does that well, mean well survivor's guilt is when you're in a situation where where uh you know like it can be a plane crash you're the only one that makes it out alive or you're in a boating accident you're the only one that makes it out alive or you're in a firefight like, like he was and the copter goes up and everyone is killed except for you you know, so survivor's guilt. So, um, you know, what, what did he tell you? I mean, did you get any good, um, you know, it sounds like people really, um, you know, you, you have a great way of opening up, yeah, getting people to open up to you. Um, you know, what were some of the things I know you said survivor's guilt, but what are some of the things that, yeah, the main, the main thing was just being quiet with him, just being with him. I think a lot of times, people try to force too many, too many questions. I mean, especially young, young therapists, you're, you're sitting with somebody and it's like, you know, you're counting like one, 1,000, two, 1,000. They're not saying anything. Uh, you know, I, I think I need to say something. I, I actually had a session one time when I had my office at right turn patient came in, we introduced ourselves, you know, sat down. Um, and for 50 minutes, we just stared at each other. Nothing, nothing. And usually the average person, you can only go one or two minutes. If you're face to face with somebody, you, you, you can only go one to two minutes without feeling the need to have to say something because of the silence between you both and stuff. But we went for 50 minutes. And um, at the end of it, I said, so do you want to come back? And he said, yeah, de definitely. I went, oh, OK. And he said, you know, the fact that you could just sit here and be with me for 50 minutes and not feel the need to talk your head off. Yeah, I'll come back. And stuff, and he did, and then he slowly started started talking through the next session. And stuff. But you so meet you never people where they're at, but you try not to leave them there, you know. So, um, 
Why do you think, I mean, was this, was this gentleman, um, you know, going back to the vet, did he have post-traumatic stress as well? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, basically that was his first major spill, you know, and then, then after that, you know, he was working with, with John Dolan after that, cause he was a Vietnam vet too. So that identification piece, you know, that's why we talk a lot of times about, you know, support groups can be really beneficial to people, uh, you know, if they're able to identify with others that are going through what they're going through or they've been through it or, you know, so, so I'm sure that John, John, John was the case manager too. And stuff. He wouldn't talk to anybody, but John, but he spoke to me at 3 AM and I passed that on to John, you know, so. Um, you know, obviously, and uh, Beth, feel free to chime in, but one of the things that I don't know if people realize is, is that there is a huge number of veterans that commit suicide. Yeah. A- yeah. And um, in fact, it's 52% above what non-civilians or non-veterans sure. um, right. go, go through. Mm-hmm. Um, why do you think, why do you think that is? Why do you think that, um, you know, uh, the veteran well, space. I, I mean, when you, when, when you look at it, you know, PT, PTSD wasn't even recognized as a clinical, a clinical malady until what, I think it was 1984, you know, before that, oh, they're shell shocked. I mean, my father was in the second world war in a bomber squadron in England. And I mean, I can remember him nights growing up as a kid, he'd be sitting in his lazy boy. He'd be staring at a TV that was off with a quarter doer scotch in his hand, smoking a pipe. And you knew he was back over there. You know, and he uh, he actually had survivor's guilt himself. You know, he was he was uh, a bombing mission came up and he was too drunk to go up. And they get, they put a substitute gunner in for him and the plane didn't come back. It got shot down and stuff. So so he had survivor's guilt from that. And, you know, he was going out with a woman in London. He went into visit her on leave and her building had been bombed and she was killed. I mean, you know, it's just it's just this this crazy stuff that comes up. But I mean. I think with the vets now and stuff is, you know, I mean, again, you know, we, we're, we're going through, you know, I mean, I, I don't know about, did they give the proportion of women to men that suicide that are vets? No, no. Because I would, I would think it would probably be higher with men because men don't like talking about feelings. It's a societal piece. They'll well, that was men were men. Addi- yeah. The you old... know, they'll tell you all day long about addiction, but mental health. I mean, you know, I've run men's groups before and they can be three weeks or a month before people begin to open up. You know, and stop. So. Well, it's really it's, tough. it's hard to do. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, he uh, you know, when he said um, was this gentleman that the vet was yeah. he uh, was it alcohol his drug of choice. Yeah. So, OK, yeah. alcohol was the, was the drug of choice. And there's someone who's got depression um, or any kind of issues. Alcohol is a huge. It's, it's still. A huge, yeah. Right. So if you're depressed, you're going to be more depressed. Yeah. Although, although, although as a little side note here, and I, I don't know if Beth will back me up on it, but you know, when there were, when there were times when I felt like I was getting a little manic I thought a drink would calm me down and all it did was disinhibit me. And I was, I was even crazier, you know? So of, co- know, of, of course Beth, now did you find that, that, that affect Beth? <laughs> that yes. Um, I thought it would stop my brain from right. doing what it was right. doing and it did not do that. Oh. And then the next day was, painful for many reasons but one of it was the anxiety and depression that came from having the drinks right like it was like instant and then yeah. that starts the cycle were you yeah. a drink alone kind of person Beth, or did you just kind of oh yes um at the end of my drinking career yes i was um because at the career yeah <laughs> i had two 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 uh two sobrieties kind of that started one that didn't stick and then one that has stuck um luckily for me um mm-hmm. the first one by the time that was time for me to stop drinking um it was a issue everywhere i went and everyone wanted me to stop so i would do it by myself because okay. it was um you know felt it was shameful well you know what's yeah. crazy right now and i've been seeing this and i don't know if people have noticed this so you know i worked in the tv business for a long time and um when i um when we, we were and I sold airtime, you know, I sold commercials and I remember we could never have alcohol commercials on very rarely could you have um, commercials for hard liquor. You could run beer during like sporting events, but you couldn't run hard liquor. Now there's hard liquor ads again. 
So I've been seeing um, last year there was the craziest commercial. We actually played it last year um, on our previous uh, venture, the map. And it was a, I think it was a Johnny Walker commercial, I think. And it was right during the middle of the pandemic where the guy would be at home and he would be drinking this hard alcohol and he'd be looking at household objects and he started seeing faces with the household objects basically saying, if you're going to drink alone, you can meet all kinds of new friends in your house. So like the oh sink, <laughs> right? It was funny. It was funny. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah the mop. There was a mop that he looked at and hello, Mr. Mop, right? This is what this guy was doing. So he was really glorifying drinking at home. Fast forward and they pulled that spot. That spot was gone. Now, I don't know if there was an outrage about this spot, but I mean, don't promote drinking at home during a pandemic, right? Like not, not a great idea. So no, no we saw the numbers go up the chart. Beth and I have seen the numbers, I mean, yeah. you know, 90,000 people last year, 25% jump from the year before. And then, and then, oh, the dealers were so happy when people were getting their checks and stuff. How much of that check Ugh. can I get? Said the dealers, you know, that I mean, was, that was not fantastic. No, no, it was, it no. was freaking horrible. It was horrible, man. Well, so. Chris is going to be our resident uh, expert when talking about what's, what's on the street because she knows so when she she's back but um you know when you guys know too but um but now johnny johnny walker's running a commercial again drinking alone um at your house you know on your fire escape. george thorogood song <laughs> i drink alone so you know so alcohol is still the the drug that you know is still um still the the drug of choice for most people. So I know you deal a lot with that, Willie, and your yeah, yeah. Beth wants to say something. I can go ahead, Beth. Yeah, go ahead, so Beth. It's funny that you talk about the commercials because um, I find this to be a real issue, actually. So I only do streaming services now because there's no commercials. Because- That's not true. Hulu, Hulu is okay. I pay for uh, Hulu no, without not ads. The, not the Hulu. <laughs> I okay. I pay no ads, and I'll tell you, yeah. Yeah. I had high, high, highfalutin. You are. Uh, not really, but I'm kidding. Um, I'm kidding. I don't have I don't have cable through it. I just have like Hulu. So yeah, yeah. The, I will say I did have the Hulu that you had the ads for a little while, and every it felt and maybe it's because I'm sober, but there was an aggressive amount of commercials about alcohol. Yep. I did not mm-hmm. like that, so I switched my service. Um, right. And then the other thing is is one of the best papers I've ever written for any of my um stu- like uh, educational pursuits was mm-hmm. about the reality tv on bravo the real housewives of whatever county and how much they drink and how much i think that must influence like the mommy drinking culture i know we're not talking about the mommy drinking culture today but there is no, they that, drink aggressively yeah. on those shows it is in every scene every well, single you, scene well you know beth too and you know having come from an extremely affluent town but from a middle class family i was from greenwich connecticut and stuff and when I was growing up, there were no alcoholics in Greenwich. They were just problem drinkers of those that can't hold their liquor. And when someone, when someone, you know, if someone died from cirrhosis, your, your family was begging the doctor to put down anything but cirrhosis, put down heart attack. And it's like, you know, as if, as if everyone didn't know your loved one was walking around yellow jaundice for six months before they died. But there were no alcoholics. So when you get into the affluent society, you know, the affluent sections of society, yeah, there's no alcoholics. It's just, you know, problem drinkers are those that can't hold their liquor. Mm-hmm. You know? so. Well, Hulu, and I just, uh, well, before we talk about that, um, because you're right, Hulu, a lot of ads, and they're actually running it during Dope Sick, which I wanted to talk about, which is just insane it's to so me. Good. It's so okay, good. We'll, it we'll get to it that in a second. We'll get to that in a second. But yeah. um, for, you know, veterans, um, just wrapping, tying it up on veterans, yeah. Um, the the V is VA is actually currently trying to do something about this. They've uh, created a new ad campaign um, called "Don't Wait, Reach Out," and what they're trying to do is get veterans to seek help and available resources to them on the VA uh, website. I actually saw one of the commercials and I was like, "What is this about?" And mm-hmm. it was um, a commercial which encourages vets to properly store their firearms and remind them that suicide thoughts will pass and keeping their firearms locked will help. It was kind of weird. I get it. 
it was just kind of like, what am I watching here? Why does this guy have a lock for his gun? And then they explained that it was because of suicide, you know, to, to try to prevent veteran suicide. So, yeah. um, they are trying to help that. So, um, you know, so just, uh, something to keep in mind and, uh, you know, we'll look forward to hearing more of Willie's stories as we, uh, go. Cause he's got how many will? I'm like 46, 47. And I'm writing more and more now for that, for that other venture that I'm thinking of. That's that right. Will, that will be one of my actresses. It'll be great. You know, and stuff. <laughs> da, 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 da. All right. So, um, you know, this is a, the next segment. Um, what we're going to do going forward is we'll plan to have a guest. Um, but you know, for this show, we're just kind of keeping it to us, but we, the plan is to have a guest and that'll be somebody, an author or somebody from the world of sports entertainment, um, the industry of mental health industry. So it'll be, um, you know, we'll have a, a guest talking about some relevant. Maybe topics. we could have canine guests too, you know? I dog day afternoon. Dog day, yeah. And yeah, I, I have a dog. Going, you know? I have a dog. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, um, but I also wanted to wrap up stuff with a, um, some parting shots about relevant topic. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, I've been watching dope sick on Hulu and I'm so glad that the both of you have seen it. I love it. And it's actually a very, very frightening look at what role Purdue Pharma has played in the opioid yeah, and how they pick, how they pick areas of the country where people were doing hard physical labor for work and you had a higher incidence of people getting hurt and or just chronic pain from working in the mines and working forestry and, you know, horrendous. Yeah. So, so really um, what kind of the premise is, is that, I mean, I think you could, there's a lot of uh, moving parts to this. I'll kind of give you my take on a couple of things and you guys can chime in. But one of the things that I found in that is is that um opioid abuse can affect everyone in and whether you're um you know from a professional to you know um a, a blue collar person working in the mine you could be in the medical field it's it it doesn't matter who it does not discriminate who you are with yeah, it just, just, just just before you go a little further i mean every person that uses substance you probably you're affecting what four or five or six other people by your use. So. Yeah. So there's that. Right. But then there's the other issue. Cause, um, you know, in one of my past incarnations, it shows, uh, you know, I, I read an article, I read a, a response to an opioid epidemic article and overdoses. And somebody said, you know what, this is killing people who actually need painkillers. The actually, the people who actually need painkillers are being penalized by the people who are abusing it. What do you guys say to that? I, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I, well, that was the whole issue when Zohydro was coming out. Zohydro, you know, there was a, a protest at the state house. I, I was up there too. Zohydro, um, it, was, uh, it was 10 times more powerful than oxycodone. Uh, and um, it, it was pure opiate. It was basically like, like, like pharmaceutical heroin, pure and stuff. And they wanted to have it come out strictly for the use for, for chronic pain, you know, or for terminal, terminal illness was the first one, but then they were trying to get it over to chronic pain. The FDA's own select committee on, uh, on opioids voted it down 10 to, 10 to nothing uh, uh, at that time for the way that it was, the, the way that it was presented, because it didn't have, didn't have a safety coding on it. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't really meet the requirements. And, uh, the, the director of the time of the FDA, I forget the woman's name, uh, she ended up overruling a 10-person select committee on opiates to allow it to be manufactured. And I think, uh, you know, the interesting thing was three years later, she stepped down when it was learned that she and her husband had like, oh, I don't know, $60 million worth of pharmaceutical stocks. So, right. So know, there's a money talks, man. You know, it just does. It just does. Um, Beth, I'm going to go to you in a second. Yeah. The other thing. I mean, there's so many hidden messages in this. The other thing I thought was really interesting is um, Michael Keaton is fabulous in this role. And he actually played um, a substance abuser in a movie called Clean and Sober about a yes. million years ago. Yes. Um, and and so the thing about Michael Keaton is um, he's a widower and he um, his life is pretty dark. 
and I don't want to spoil it for an interview. Yeah, they just did an interview with him this past Sunday morning about this show. This is past Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. No. It was the week before, a couple of weeks ago. It, it was part of I. I forget the, you know the uh, oh god the Sunday morning show. The woman's been around forever. She's has bipolar disorder. Jane Pauley. Oh, okay. Jane so, Pauley had an interview with her with, with him. Yeah. It, it's really an interesting um, story about, you know, um, re- I think it's about, um, I think there's a loneliness factor to this that they kind of cover. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of moving parts to it. I, I just think it's excellent. And if half of it's true about um, Purdue Pharma, these people are, are, are loathsome, really, truly lo- a loathsome group. Oh, they're shysters. But- Beth, what, what say you about this? Oh, I think it's fantastic. I think it's heartbreaking. Um, I don't, I deal with, um, my work is more with people who have alcohol um, abuse issues just because that's what I know. So the opioid thing, but um, I do know a couple of people personally that have been impacted by the opioids and they just say it's, it's like this high that you'll never be able to get back. And I always think of the Johan Hari book, Lost Connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that's what the whole book is about, like chasing the scream, like the, and then the opposite of William, I'm probably going to say it wrong. The opposite of connection is disconnection. So, right. you know, his character is alone and sad. And while he's doing that, the whole time I'm watching it, I'm like, he does this great work and he really cares about everyone. And then it shows you the progression over the five episodes I've seen so far yeah. of how you become a completely different person. And yeah. And starts, you know what? He starts taking them and then he's going through his drawer and it's just empty bottles. And you know why? Kicked off and- well, I'm going to tell you why, though, because I thought about this and I, I, I've taken a lesson from this. Right. Okay. Not everybody is your friend, first and foremost. There's a lot of people that you have to understand you can't open up to. Right. Because they're they got their own agenda. OK. Yeah. And that was one of the things one of the themes I thought is, is like, you know, People Are you tend- talking about between the government agencies and stuff? Too, no, right? I'm talking about yeah, with or the what? rep, with the pharmaceutical rep. Yeah. Oh, what a little scumbag. Yeah, He's but you know what, though? He's a I've worked with guys like that in my early yeah. days of, of yeah. selling radio advertising. I worked with those kind of guys. They don't have a conscience because it's about the money for them. They That's don't it. see... Yeah. It's it's about... They don't wanna, well, they don't want to see. They don't no, see it's sales contests. Yeah. I I have PTSD from sales, believe it or not, because of of the mentality of more, 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 more. Right. So you yeah. got these young people who don't know any better are going out pushing a drug that is not um good. And so, you know, you have Michael Keaton and he really has specific needs that is not being met with his career so he really opens up with this guy and gets starts getting his ego stroked and you know and and suddenly his darkness turns to light because you can kind of see it in the in his um where he lives in appalachia to now being at these big conferences and speaking and people want to now hear what he has to say where you didn't so it it kind of like address it, it there was a whole a whole lifestyle that began as he began this association with mm. with um painkillers with the uh, with oxycodone actually they talk about oxycontin and which is different than oxycodone correct correct okay what do you what do you think about that do you do you think my theory is plausible at all which part of it about the loneliness and that how he you know the association with Purdue Pharma really started to bring more aspects to his life than not necessarily just treating patients. I think it gave him, it, 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 it connected him. He had kind of a, um, no, no, I think, I think it, I think the use, the use drove him in the loneliness. You know, he had a good relationship. No, because he wasn't using family. before. The, no, because he wasn't using, he wasn't using before. He, yeah. He wasn't using before. Maybe, you know the th- the thing with the thing with an opioid like oxy too is you you may take one just to try it, but the probability is you, by just trying it you're hooked in. It's a one shot deal. It's not like other things where you know you try this, you try that, you walk away. I mean oxy is is just such a rush when you talk to people. It's like instant addiction, Andy. That's absolutely. 
absolutely terrifying. Like that is probably yeah. why this is probably one of the most terrifying things. One time in my life, I got Percocets because I fractured my tailbone and they made mm. me violently ill. Thank goodness. So I never touched yeah. them again. Yeah. And I've never explored that area. That's not to say that my life might not have gone that direction. Luckily I got stopped when I did, yeah. but, um, to, to watch it happen and to see, and then I always think of addiction, how, when I was actively drinking, the person I was then is nowhere near the person I am now, right? right. Like I got to get right. my life back. I got to go back to the person that I probably originally started as when I was a, a good person. Yeah, well, there, and you see him a, doing that. There was a book years ago, Andy, years and years ago called Chasing the Dragon. And that, that's basically, that's about the opiate people. And you'll have addicts that will, uh, you I shouldn't say addicts. I hate using that term now. You have people with the substance use disorder that's opiate and it's like, they're chasing that first high and they never, in all the years I've worked in the field, I've only had like two people that said they got almost, almost that first high, but never, but never the exact, but that's what, you know, the whole driving force. And that's what isolates you off from everybody is because you want to get that first high back and they never do. You know what depresses me? You know what bothers me as a normie quote, normie, I'm really not that normal, but as a normie, well, you're normal for you. Yeah. I'm normal for me. Um, you know, when we worked with our, in our old radio show, we had a guy who, um, really started to clean up his life, right? Like we, you know, and I was a big part of trying to help him clean up his life and, oh, and, okay. Okay, I know what you mean. Yeah. and, and rebuild things for him and make, you know, and I took great pride in helping someone kind of get to a place where life started to be good. Yeah, helping good. someone to help themselves. Correct. And I felt yeah. so good about it. Like I was really excited about it. And I knew there were other people I've helped along the way where, whether it's I'm giving them jobs, you know, helping them with work and giving them opportunities to make a few bucks. And, and, uh, and then, but then what disappointed me is I think Chris is commenting on, on, on chat, but I don't have, I don't know where she is, so huh. I can't hear her. So sorry, Chris. Anyway, um, so so what I think is what I think is pretty interesting is, is that it broke my heart. That broke my heart to see somebody that I helped and I, you know, as a friend, right, not as a family member, as a friend or someone who cared, not because I was a family member. It broke my heart to, to see somebody like you got your life together and then you go off the rails really hard to deal with that was really hard to see that and it's it happens yeah, I, a lot I can, yeah i can tell you a quick quick story along that one i had a former student and i, I actually had his girlfriend too as, as, as a student at one time they both work in the field and uh you know he he's he's the director of a sober house obviously i'm not going to say which one and stuff but uh his his girlfriend called me up this was years ago the girlfriend called me up and said hey i uh think you should talk to mike not his real name Mike and stuff. I said, why? Well, what's going on? Well, he was, he was case managing a couple of young guys at the house and he thought everything was going good. And they both overdosed and died in the same week. And he went, went to both wakes and funerals with, you know, these distraught mothers and the mothers were trying to figure out how it could have happened. And, and he's thinking about leaving the business. I said, Oh, and I said, uh, yeah, I'll give him a call. So I gave him a call and he said to me, you know, you know, exchange the pleasantries and stuff. And I said, Hey, how are you? And he, he goes, well, you obviously know what's going on because we haven't spoken in more than a year and you're not just calling me out of the blue. And right. I said, yeah, you're right. You're a hundred percent right. And I said, you know, give me the gig, give me the story, man. But, but what happened? And he went on and, you know, I was working with these guys and they were going to meetings and they were doing everything that was suggested to them. And they both overdosed and died in the same week. And uh, I'm just thinking about leaving the business and stuff. And I, and I said, well, you know, you're at that point, you, you have to understand that, you know, death sometimes is going to happen you know and he, well you know i was you know so long as so long as you're doing everything that you believe is in your client's best interest that you know then you won't make a mistake well you know then he's like well what am i supposed to do now and i said you don't know what you're supposed to do now and he goes no i said you move on to the next person and try to make a difference that's what you do that's what you do you know you never you never like the fact that people die you know and you don't want to get to the point where you're numb to it but yeah, you know, it's, it's part of the nature of this beast that we work with, you know? So what do you do? You, you move on to the next person and try to make a difference. And he's still working in the field now. So, 
you know, but it, it's, it's like we're not God. And if you, you know, if you're God inclined, yeah, you know, you may be doing work on behalf of a higher power, but you're not the higher power. You know, so right. And I, I look, like you take a personal affront. How dare them overdose? That's how I took it. I, I, t- counsel, I took know? it that way because I was like, hmm. I cleaned up. I helped you clean up your house. Right. And 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 go through and 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 really hope that we could is build it, that. I think we could build that. Beth, that, go ahead. You're you're wait, looking wait, wait, like just, you got some. I just stuff want to say to Andy, you know, you're not mad at him. You're mad at his addiction. Yeah. You're not mad at him, the person. You're no, I've battled addiction. with it for a long time yeah. about this guy and other people that I've worked with that feel like that. <laughs> yeah, my my because my bar is very high for people okay. and my expectations are out of whack. Go ahead, Beth. Go ahead, Beth. But what I was going to say is, <laughs> and this might not be this person's story. I don't know who this person is, but um, you do. You know, him. but go right. ahead. All right. So I'll use myself as an example. When I relapsed, I let everybody down and I'm taught not five or six people. I mean, my web went far, 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 far. What was I'm so, so grateful for is that Mm -hmm. I've been able to own that and say, I'm sorry to everyone that I hurt with that action. And I know that's not going to happen with everyone. And I mean, there's people that I have worked with and, or I've helped in my personal life that have not had that, but I'm always like, thank God I got to make amends or whatever you want to call it for my behavior, because that to me was like the big lesson in everything. Yeah. And I get to raise a human that knows to say they're sorry or own their own their side of the stuff. And it's super frustrating when the person doesn't do it. I mean, I can't tell you, I can't count properly how many people I let down. It was just too big of a, a, a wave. You know what? I'm cool with that. If you uh, uh, like the one person, okay. So the one person, um, his family was also sick in the way it went about. So there was a lot of enabling there and a lot of using people mm-hmm. type of thing. And so I never got a any kind of, hey, I'm sorry yeah. kind of thing for for that, knowing that you were coming pure of heart. Okay, so that was one. The other one that I worked with just completely went radio silent after already apologizing to me. Ghosting. And I, what's that? Ghosting. Yeah, he ghosted, right? which is great. I'm happy because he was asking me for money and always had an excuse and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be more selective now because I don't need to do that. Right. Like, like I don't, I'm not in the, I don't get paid by anybody in the industry. I don't, I do this cause I felt like it's the right thing to do, you know, for me to help you know, with whatever. And I know it's a screwed up situ- uh, system. So I wanted to do something about it. So that's my motivation. But yeah, I felt let down. And like you said, Willie, it's more about the addiction than than the person. But um, yeah, it's tough. And I could see it from a parent perspective, how it really hurts people. But it's interesting, too, because it's like the addiction, right? you're mad at it, but since I, since I've done whatever I've done, whatever recur- recovery journey I'm on and the way I've used education as part of like my, uh, my recovery, I'm like, yeah, people can get mad at the addiction. But I also was like, yeah, you had every right to get mad at me because I was not the same person that you knew. And so, yes, you ha- like, and it took a long time with some people to get them back and to say I was, you know, to be able to physically see them to say I was sorry because it was years and years and years of letting people down. And like, I don't know, like an example now, like I can text one of my brothers and be like, hey, do you want me to babysit Tuesday night? I never did that stuff before. Like just like a really easy, simple thing. Like I get to hang out with my nieces and you can go to the movies. That's a nice. That's step. why I like you. You know why? Because you own your stuff, right? You, you own and you show up yeah. and you show up. So to me. That's why I'm a fan of yours because you're you're out there, right? You own you own your your stuff, right? Yes, I do. You 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 had stuff, mm-hmm. you had you had trouble and you don't make excuses. I've never heard an excuse out of your mouth. Um, you Thank know. You. No, you. it's the truth. It's I the truth. That. It means I'm being honest. Thank you. I like Believe that. me cuz I don't buy cuz I I don't like that when people don't answer the bell or show up. It's just not my my thing and I yeah. and it's probably good or bad but that's just me for my own stuff I can't because I'll get caught up in 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 people who 
you know, I'll start feeling guilty. I'm a friendly narcissist, I was told. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't find you narcissist. No. I'm a friendly narcissist, so there's yeah. a, a like there's a no trump. Thing. There's a false friendly, so long as you're complimenting me and giving me what I want. I love you, man. You're my best buddy. You don't do something I want, you're dead. You're dead to me. <laughs> you're dead to me. Get out. That's you got to throw a perfect yeah. game when you deal with me. Yeah, you're, you're, throw, that's throw. a narcissist. If I... You know, if I can't benefit from you, if you're not praising me, then yeah, then you're not in my sphere. Yeah. I know a lot of people like that. Okay. Well, All right. Say, you know, interesting side note on that. They say that pro- probably the majority of the top CEOs in the country are narcissists. Of course Shocker. they are. Shocker. Of course they are. You Shocker. have to, Shocker. you have, cause you know why? <laughs> because, and I have to get a grip on this myself is mm. there is a motive. Uh, there is a something inside of me that I can't, like, it burns inside of me to... to. Hope it's not an alien. No, for success, right? It burns inside of me. It, like, and be competitive, you know? Like, I went on this weight loss thing real quick. I lost 30 pounds, okay? You know why? Not because of my health. Because my little cousin lost a hundred and we were at a family thing and he kept getting all the, all the oh, praise. Oh, you're competitive. You got a competitive. Right? I was pissed off about it. I'm like, you know what? You know what, dude? I can lose it. He's half my age, by the way. And I'm like, you know what? Screw you. I'm going to lose weight just because you were getting the praise. I know. Isn't that crazy? Crazy thought process. But that's me. A little immature. But, of uh, course it is. <laughs> but th- I'm owning it, though. I'm I'm telling the truth. That you motive- are owning it, Andy. You are owning that it. Own- yeah. All right. So that's our show for the week. Why? Um, it's early. <laughs> no, because Beth's got it. Because... Um, I have an appointment today that got Because she has to show up. I got to take off her doctor's appointment. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. I'm just saying it's good for me. What do you mean nobody cares? Nobody cares. I'm kidding. I care. Listen, if you you or a loved one is struggling with mental health issues, please contact SAMHSA. And what does SAMHSA stand for, Willie? Uh, Yeah. Substance abuse, mental health, and I forgot, uh, it's a clearing house where you can get any information you want on anything. Yeah, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. The ninth caller. If you're the ninth caller and you can answer what SAMHSA is, then you'll get uh, tickets too. You'll get a hat like Andy's wearing. Yes, we're going to have hat day. Hat yeah. day. I have a hat or a brooch. Um, so you still have that Kraken t-shirt for me, man? I do. I do. Okay, when I good. see you, you got it. All right. The alcohol company Kraken? No, no. The, oh, new, like, the, the new NHL hockey team in uh, Seattle, <laughs> which didn't even air on local television in Seattle, believe it or not. By the way, you know, you know, like, oh, my, you know, the, the, the grossest drink that my clients have gotten into over over the last couple Gelatas? of years. Is, no, it's that uh, fireball. Yeah, that's oh, my, my neighbor. God. My neighbor drinks that. I'm going to have some fireball tonight. Just, just another quick note, too. The, the the alcohol industry, the liquor industry, is the only industry that's not required by the FDA to list all their ingredients on their bottles or, or can. All they have to put down is the percentage of alcohol. They don't have to tell you about foaming agents. They don't have to tell you about dyes that they use to make the color. They don't have to tell you about preservatives. Nothing. All they have to tell you is the percentage of alcohol. There's a great book written by that. I like that. Uh, Quit Like a Woman by Holly Whitaker. It's designed for women getting sober but she goes through like all of that it's very eye-opening to see yeah can you help us get her for the show she is like big she had a billboard that's okay that's okay i'll dm her all the time because no one is uh we can get anybody all right samsa all right here's the phone number for samsa it is 1-800 this is a national hotline if you or someone needs help it's 1-800-662-HELP at 4357 and that's their national hotline it's chock filled with research and information so that's the place i would i think we should send people to to get help and uh i wanted to thank mike weber back at mission control at foxborough you know, hold Kid. on hold on just a second andy because i want to give out one more number then you're, you're giving out numbers um Massachusetts has their, their substance abuse hot hotline and that's it's hot uh, hot yeah hotline yeah hot hotline it's uh that's 1-800-327-5050 so if you're right in Massachusetts that would prob- probably be the better one to call Samson's national federal so I, I would have them call the uh, go local you know, the helpline go local 
All right. Parting shots? No, this has been great. Okay. <laughs> you you good? Okay. So um we'll keep we'll keep the uh keep the ball rolling. Uh Beth, you got any parting shots? No, this has been great. Thank you guys so much for having me join you. This is really this is really fun. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. It's okay. On, yeah, absolutely. All right. On behalf of myself, Willie, Chris, and Beth, we'll see Chris next week, we hope. Um this has been the new podcast mental matters have a great weekend and we'll see you next time